Today's video is going to be from an absolutely uh, amazing uh, and inspiring uh, lady by the name of Anne O'Shea, uh, who uh, it, the, the night's story really is uh, one of uh, a love story, but a lot of heartbreak uh, because Anne unfortunately lost her husband, uh, Charlie, to Huntington's disease about four years ago. So I'd implore you, uh, take the, the 10 minutes or so to uh, listen to Anne's story. And most importantly, uh, please give generously to uh, the, the cause that we're uh, raising money for, uh, as all of the, the funds raised do go to the front line to provide uh, better cures, better care and support uh, for these individuals. So please give generously and I look forward to uh, welcoming Anne uh, right now. Thank you very much. A uh, big thank you for joining us Anne and welcome on board today. John, thank you so much for having me on. It's a great honour and I have to say I'm just so overwhelmed. I'm so delighted to be um, here to share my story and also Christy's story, most importantly. So, um, Anne, tell me about uh, Christy. I met Christy in Cyprus in 2000. I was over there, my brother was getting married and he was living next door to me and he was just an amazing person. I hadn't been on a foreign holiday before. Um, he kind of took me under his wing and actually I had been sick while I was there. I had an ear infection and he just looked after me really well. And we, it took about two weeks before something kind of blossomed. He told me he was gay which he wasn't, but that was just his way of, I suppose, building a trust. And then he told me the night before that he wasn't. He asked for my number. We came back to Dublin. He came back to Dublin. I came back to my hometown in Limerick. And we started a, a lovely romance. There was a long journeys up and down to Dublin and it progressed from there. We went back a year later. We got engaged in Cyprus. Uh -huh. And yeah, so it was just amazing. Um, it was a whirlwind. I mean, everyone thought it wouldn't last because it was a long distance and it was also a holiday romance, but it did, it lasted. We got engaged and then about a year later, I moved to Dublin. I got a transfer with my job and Christy worked as a security man. So, um, I mean, at the time he was very bubbly, very outgoing, full of humour, very cheeky smile, um, lovely, lovely dresser. Uh, he smoked. He loved his bets, he betted on horses, and he loved his few drinks and women. He was a typical man. There was no, yeah. A larger than life uh, character. Larger than life, a great sense of humor. And when, when did you notice uh, that things weren't quite right um, with Christy? And what were the kind of telltale signs really that uh, he had Huntington's? Okay, um, Christy told me very early on that his father had Huntington's and it was in the family. And there was a possibility that he could inherit the gene and I knew nothing about Huntington's and I actually thought he, it was like him trying to say, it's not you, it's me, you know, but it, he, he said, no, I just want to prepare you that I could end up in a wheelchair. And I, I just thought this was going to be later down the line. I didn't think anything more. Um, from day one, Christy had sometimes on occasion tremor of the hands. He could be off balance on his feet. He, you know, when he'd stand up, he was six foot. So initially he could be a little bit off balance. And then he had slurred speech. But I often put that down to maybe he's had a few drinks, even though he'd say, no, that wasn't the case. But apparently they had all been actual early symptoms of the condition. And it wasn't until his job suspected he was drinking while on duty. And he was, he was asked um, by his employer to uh, go out to leave the job and to be superannuated because they think he had an, an alcohol problem. So um, Christy set out to prove them wrong. He went to his GP who, who knew that Huntington's was in the family. And he himself did suspect that Christy was showing symptoms for probably two, two years previous. Um, and from there, Christy was sent to the neurologist in St. James's Hospital. A blood test was taken. Immediately they suspected it was Huntington's. And we were told we'd be brought back nine months later for the result. Nine months? Yeah, nine months. Now, in the meantime, there was a lot of denial and Christy just wanted to prove his job wrong. He, I do believe he suspected he had the condition, but he was very much in denial. He set about doing a lot of research on, online uh, through Discovery Channel. He was watching every documentary he could under the sun um, in relation to neurological conditions. 
um, he started looking at alternative remedies and there is no cure for Huntington's. There's a lot of research, there's a lot of positive research being done all around the world, but as yet there is no known cure. Um, we're, we're really desperate that, you know, that someday it will happen. But um, Christy decided he wanted to try acupuncture. So he did that for uh, maybe a year or two. He tried uh, herbal treatment. He tried acupuncture. And eventually we went to Ukraine. We did a lot of research on stem cell treatment. And Christy believed this was, it, it was clinging on to hope. He was desperate. He really wanted to find something that was going to help him. I mean, when we met, we had loads of dreams, just like any young couple. We were going to get married. We were going to have kids. We had names with everything planned. We wanted to have our own home. We we're in the process of looking at getting a mortgage for our own, our own place. We were living with his mother, but um, that wasn't to be because very, very soon after I moved to Dublin, his, the Huntington's, it took over. So it's interesting, uh, Anne, kind of prior to kind of the mermaids taking on the, the whole uh, campaign around brain conditions uh, this summer, I'd never really heard of uh, Huntington's disease, but kind of my perspective on it as more and more as I learn was like an underground condition that, uh, you know, people aren't so forthcoming with it. But what, no. what's your take on that? Well, um, to be honest, I'd never heard of it myself and a lot of people hadn't heard of it. And, and I was learning a lot as I went along. What I really discovered was there's a lot of people with Huntington's around Ireland, around the world. But unfortunately, there's such a stigma attached to having Huntington's. A lot of people don't want it to be known. Um, in Ireland, the, like if, if you're going for a mortgage or if you're going for um, a if you want to get a uh, move on in your job, like a, get a promotion. If you say the Huntington's is in the family, you are stigmatized against, unfortunately, even insurance, getting insurance. If you say it's in the family, again, you're going to be weighed on the fact that it's in the family, even though you yourself may have a negative result, but you have to be 18 before you get tested. And a lot of people choose not to get tested. I, I think for me and Christy, we were lucky in the fact that we didn't have a mortgage. We didn't have kids. We, we knew early enough to make decisions. We had a lot of, I, I think, you know, as we moved on through the years, we realized how lucky we really were that we did find out early. I think for a lot of families, it's, it's very difficult because when it is in the family, you know that there's brothers and sisters who may already have, they may have the gene. There is a parent that may have a gene. And also if you have kids, you could have four or five kids and each child has a 50-50 chance of having Huntington's. We depend very much on the Huntington's Association and we depend on the fundraising efforts of anyone that can support the, the association and the families because the families themselves are very absorbed in the condition and, and you're, the person with Huntington's are very dependent. So yes. the family, it's very difficult when you're in that, in that bubble to do anything or to even try and raise awareness. For me and Christy, we, I, I think for Christy, it was very important. He took on the, it was a, he, he had a sense of purpose because we started raising awareness for the association. We started doing um, UCD presentations to medical students and wow. it just changed Christy's life. It all of a sudden he felt he was giving back. I think it was very important that he felt he, he still had a purpose in life. And the fact that we were raising awareness, it, it, he still felt he was important. You so know. how long was that process, Anne, between, um, you know, noticing that things weren't quite right, you know, and being superannuated and worked to, you know, the, the, the you know, quite dramatic decline where he's totally dependent on you for his everything. But from the time he got superannuated, superannuated from the job, it took probably 10 years before he lost his mobility. And when he lost his mobility, he started to lose a lot of weight. His swallow seemed to go. And it took a probably a further, like from the time of the mobility being gone, it took six years of sometimes the deterioration would come, the slurred speech would come, would be there. And then maybe you'd get a, a, a period of time where his speech may come back a little bit. And the swallow just seemed to go. He was on a pig feeding tube for the last six years of his life. It, it was a struggle. Everything was a struggle. 
I mean, simple things that you think would be, I mean, with a person who's got a neurological condition and it was a chronic illness, but because there's so little awareness out there, where Christy had to rely on the Huntington's Association to raise that awareness, to provide the information, to support with funding. Like we really, I think the whole of Ireland are really dependent on the association for the information to come to the medical professionals because they're not aware. And when we go to try and get services that we need, that we know we need, like we know that I would have known that Christy would have needed a dietitian. He would have known he would have needed a physiotherapist. He would have needed all these different services. But this, the services themselves, you had to fight for them. And we had to rely on the association to help us with that fight. So it was, it was not only the person themselves, it was me as an advocate, but also the association had to support us in contacting letters, everything that we needed had to come from them as well. Well, hopefully anyway, through the, you know, every stroke that the mermaids take over the summer, uh, you know, in our campaign to swim from Ilfracombe to, to Swansea that, uh, you know, we can raise, you know, an extra euro or pound uh, here or there to, to make a tangible difference, not just to, to kind of the, the, the care on the, the front line for, for people like yourselves, but equally to, you know, help, you know, um, fund groundbreaking research that will eventually, please God, bring about a cure. Absolutely. No, it makes such a difference. I mean, we are so grateful to you, Joan and the, the Hensley Mermaids, because all that fundraising, what it does, like there, there's chairs that are needed for a person with Huntington's, a specialised chair that has to be made. And the association actually fund those chairs. They fund many, you know, people run into difficulty with finance, you know, paying utility bills, maybe a laptop that's needed for communication, or maybe an item that makes such a difference in a person's life. But families struggle financially, because if you, if you can imagine, most people find out maybe when they're in their 30s or 40s, they may have a family, and they may have been the breadwinner and then yes. they're out of their job and also the, the, their spouse more often than not will have to give up their job to remain in the home to care for their for their loved one i mean there there isn't enough um resources there really isn't everything is a struggle well hopefully Anne, as i say we we can do our bit anyway to um raise funds and awareness uh, in the process but you know, it's been a real pleasure uh, getting to know you over the weekend. Um, so very grateful to have you, you speak uh, on, on the Mermaids um, uh, campaign and uh, wish you the very best of luck in, uh, you know, your, your job as an advocate for Huntington's and hoping to raise awareness and funding for Huntington sufferers and families um, in Ireland. So thank, thank you so much. much. And to everyone. Thank you.